Hey guys, the chapter we're looking at today took me off guard at a vulnerable moment, and as I got angrier and more disgusted, my commentary got less coherent and I ended up having to essentially cobble sentences together in the edit. Since that doesn't make for great listening, I took a few days, consulted some of my friends, wrote up a script of the more salient points, and had another recording session. Here is the content warning I wish someone could have given me. The chapter of Ready Player One covered in this episode features Wade discussing how he'd commit suicide. Listen with care if needed. Welcome back to Ready Player None, the only podcast that says you can call me the Keymaster. Because I love to smash gatekeepers. That came out a lot more suggestive than I expected. When last we met, Wade had retrieved the Jade Key from a world of text adventures. But in the middle of the Sixes and the Gunters warring over Zorkin pals, he learned some sad news. That Daito, one of the two interchangeable Japanese samurai with whom he gunts, has died. More as this story develops in Chapter 24. The fight continues to rage on the planet of text adventures which I remind you has the stupid name of The Battle of Froboz. We're told that the Sixers are struggling to contain all 512 copies of Zork on the planet. Their resources are spread far too thin. And when the Gunter clans began their coordinated attack on the Sixers' forces, the boobs in blue began to suffer heavy casualties and were forced to pull back. What kind of flipping... What kind of teenage kid thinks boobs in blue is a... is a witty barb to call the Sixers? <laughs> boobs in blue. Is that something to do with those workplace inappropriate bodysuits they had? A few hours in when they realised this wasn't a very good strategy at all, the Sixers instead began to guard ten adjacent instances of the playing field. By setting up force fields around them, they're able to work unimpeded. Given they can hot swap whoever's controlling each avatar, they're going to have a better success rate of getting the Jade Key than the average Gunter. This turns out to be a lucrative strategy. Teams of Sixers all in lines continually complete the puzzle and gain the key. Meanwhile, the Gunter message boards are all corroborating, so everybody knows how to get in. It was there for the taking to anyone who had already cleared the first gate. So does that mean you have to have cleared the first gate to get the Jade Key? Nobody can beat you to the end of the puzzle? The scoreboard now reads that Artemis is in first place with Parzival and H second and third, Nolan Sorrento himself in fourth and Shoto in fifth, with the remaining spots taken up by six avatars. The scoreboard at this point is over 5,000 names long. Wade is distressed that Daito's slot in the high five has been replaced by Sorrento. Seeing his IOI employee number above Shoto's name made me cringe. There's a lot of things in this book that make me cringe, buddy. Even with all the message board collaboration, nobody's quite sure what happened to Daito. The leading theory is that he was killed by Sixers, but nobody's sure how. Shoto is probably the only one who knows, but Wade's unable to contact him because he's not responding to any chat requests. Like me, I assumed he was focusing all his energy on finding the second gate before the Sixers did. Turns out when he says all his energy, he means sitting in his stronghold just looking at the thing. If you remember, the clue is, continue your quest by taking the test. Wade's going out of his gourd trying to figure out what test it means. The Kobayashi Maru? The Pepsi challenge? Could the clue have been any more vague? I'm disappointed that the more was italicized in that sentence, because I would have happily pronounced it like, could the clue have been any more vague? I don't know why I'm trying to appeal to people who've watched Friends, because I never have. Turning the key over and over again in his hands is proving to be fruitless, so he goes to put it back in his inventory, and notices that the silver foil wrapper he took off it has its own inventory slot. Consequently, he's sure that the wrapper must be key to all this. I wondered if it might be a reference to Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, but then decided against it. There hadn't been any golden ticket inside the wrapper. I made a joke about Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory in the previous episode. The comparison I brought up to say how ridiculous and derivative it was has now been called out in the text. As ever, wearing your references on your sleeve does not excuse derivative storytelling. He logs out and goes to sleep for the night, and he wakes up again a few hours later at 6.12am Oasis server time, which if you remember is Eastern Standard Time because America is at the centre of the universe. It's his scoreboard alarm going off that's woken him up, but out of all of the possibilities he could think of, he was never expecting Nolan Sorrento to be the first person to clear the second gate. The Sixers now have the top spot on the scoreboard, and the first clue as to the location of the Crystal Key, which meant they were now closer to finding Halliday's Easter Egg than anyone had ever been. Wade realises he's having some sort of panic attack. Now I'll excuse the staccato list slam poem for this one, because it does paint a picture of a panic attack, racing anxious thoughts and short breaths, a total and complete freakout, a massive mental meltdown, whatever you want to call it, I went a little nuts. If only he didn't use the same tone and cadence to describe, I don't know, cereal. 
or video games, then maybe that might have been an effective and descriptive technique for this happening. He tries to call H, but H doesn't pick up. Maybe he's busy. And he considers calling Shoto, but with his brother's avatar dead, maybe he's not going to be in a receptive mood. I considered flying to Benatar to try to get Artemis to talk to me, but then I came to my senses. Cautious optimism for that sentence. She hasn't been heard from since she got the Jade Key. So maybe she's locked away in her palace just stewing with rage or trying to figure out what to do next. I'm cautiously optimistic that Wade has changed his cyber-stalking ways. I tried calling her anyway. As usual, she didn't answer. Ah! <laughs> Leave her alone. Desperate to hear another voice, he starts talking to his ma ma Max Headroom AI. But when his pre-programmed responses start repeating, it sort of shatters the illusion. You know you've totally screwed up your life when your whole world turns to shit and the only person you have to talk to is your system agent software. At least he's cognizant he screwed up his life. Wade spends the next couple of hours checking the news feeds and the message boards. Unlike when the Sixers turned up in full force on Ludus or Froboz, they're keeping the location of the second gate to themselves by acting discreetly. Following on from them farming the Jade Key, they're now also farming the second gate. Sixers are ranking high on the scoreboard, pushing down our four remaining Gunters. But it gets worse. Two days after he cleared the second gate, Sorrento's score jumped up another 30,000 points, indicating that he had just acquired the Crystal Key. Wade's nearly catatonic. This is going to be the end of the contest and the bad guys are winning. And it wasn't going to end like I'd always thought it would, with some noble, worthy Gunter finding the egg and winning the prize. Noble, worthy Gunter? I thought you said you were going to win it. This story was not going to have a happy ending. The bad guys were going to win. So he spends the next 24 hours just checking the scoreboard repeatedly. So now he's wasted at least three days. Wade's spending his time being sceptical, or at least in disbelief, that the Sixers could ever get that far. Up until now, the Sixers had only made progress by tracking Artemis H or me. He doesn't know how they could have deciphered the next clue that quickly. He suspects they found a new way to cheat. How else could they have solved the riddle so quickly, when Artemis hadn't been able to do it with several days head start? Well, at least he's treating Artemis like the more competent Gunter that she is. My brain felt like hammered Play-Doh. He can't even describe his brain turning to mush without referencing a popular brand. Whoa, deja vu. But Wade's completely out of ideas, and the Sixers keep on racking up those crystal keys. Each time one of their scores increased, it was like a knife in my heart. He's feeling hopelessness and that he's wasted five years of his life. I'd foolishly underestimated Sorrento and the Sixers, and I was about to pay the ultimate price of my hubris. It's not directly all your fault, is it? It's the fault of every Gunter. I'd already lost Artemis, and now I was going to lose the contest too. You hadn't lost her, she's not yours! Leave her alone! I'd already decided what I was going to do when it happened. Uh-oh. Okay, folks. We've reached the part where Wade contemplates suicide. I'll let the previous seven minutes of light-hearted commentary stand as a testament to how much this part blindsided me. We'll start off just by summarising the offending passage. In the event of IOI winning the contest, Wade tells us that he would start by picking a random gunter from his fan club and giving them all his items. Then he would destroy his avatar and all his progress by detonating his stronghold with himself in it. A final game over. Next, he would leave his apartment for the first time in six months, go to the Arboretum on the roof, sit up there and breathe the unfiltered city air for a while, and throw himself over the edge. This was my current plan. First, let's take a step back. There's a lot to unpack here, so we'll start with a relatively smaller issue, albeit one that's a recurring problem. Back in Chapter 21, I criticised a part where Ernest Klein described a Gunter that was surrounded by avatars she didn't like. The unfortunate use of a feminine pronoun there, I said, implied a sexual harassment subtext that wouldn't have been there had he chosen any other pronoun. Something similar happens here. Step one in Wade's suicidal ideation is picking one of the kids in my official fan club, someone with no money and a first level newbie avatar to bequeath all his gear to. As you can probably guess, he says, give her every item I owned. That choice of Gunter doesn't sound so random anymore. Imagine this female avatar. She's in a Parzival fan club, so not only does she look up to Wade, she's also less experienced than him, if not literally younger. The power dynamic there would be messed up if all he was doing was being a creep. But that's not where it ends. He's going to involve this innocent party in his last action before death. Nobody should have the burden of being put in that position. She's powerless to prevent it by his own design. That is fucked up. His glib, nonchalant confession of suicidal contemplation starts with predatory behaviour, and that isn't even the worst part. This attempt to frame his item handover as a selfless act instead comes over as yet another thing to feed his ego. Wade is the most important gunter in the universe, and everything revolves around him. He'd be driven to take such drastic action if the Sixers win. 
the consequences of which would be an end to privacy, user anonymity, and the creativity of the Oasis as we know it. Except we know that if Wade gets the egg, he wouldn't do a thing to counter that. We found out all the way back in Chapter 9 that if Wade had the prize money, he'd use it to crew a spaceship and abandon Earth, taking with them only a standalone version of the Oasis and a copy of every bit of pop culture in history. He's only nominally a protagonist in that he acts against the villains. It's only incidental to him that his gaining the fortune would prevent their plans to fiscal domination of a computer simulation. He's self-absorbed to the extreme. He thinks of Artemis only as how she relates to him and not as her own person. His excessive amassing of pop culture is more for his quest than for his own sake. I've often wondered if it's bad writing or if it's intentional that he's a self-censored egotist because his lack of examination for his own feelings and behaviours seems authentic for a teenage boy. The doyleist perspective is that this is Ernest Klein writing himself at that age because if nothing else the pop culture centric nature of this book epitomises the school of write what you know. It's strange then that someone with the emotional maturity of an adult would write a sequence like this so matter of factly. There's the same level of detachment here as when Wade tells us about early home computers, or dealing with the devil in Nolan Sorrento, or humping a lubed up robot. Though, in fairness, not as when Artemis breaks his heart back in Chapter 18. Wade threatens suicide with all the ceremony of deactivating his Facebook. The adept doylist knows he doesn't go through with it, because there are still 130 pages to go. But wait, says the wily Watsonian, this isn't the only reason we know that. If you remember, this book is narrated by Omniscient Future Wade. This macabre, tactless sequence is merely an aside to a narrator who exists in the future. Perhaps, then, the detachment represents the level of disconnect between Wade's different states of mind in the now versus in the future. Well, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, Wade Watsonian, but that line of thinking falls down when you consider quite what a mistake the omniscient future Wade framing sequence is. Tension deflates before him. He's never faced a hardship. This poorly realised life or death situation is just another of this book's verbal backspaces to make up the word count, only this one isn't eight paragraphs about an obscure TV show Ernie wants you to know he's heard of. In fact, you could argue that the inclusion of some of the quest's red herrings is just waffle for the sake of waffle, given he has the benefit of hindsight to see which of his suppositions were relevant, but maybe that's a discussion for another time. So, if Wade's death at this point is a no-go, why is this part here? I'll tell you exactly why. It's because this is the end of Act 2. Ernest Cline's writing is so uninventive and by the numbers that when his creative writing class said that this is the part of the three-act structure where the protagonist is at their most defeated, he took it to its logical extreme. But Ernie's particular flavour of protagonist presented an unusual problem. Wade is an ace at everything he turns his hand to, so how can he suffer such unimaginable loss? Ernie's solution? This hollow contemplation of suicide comes out of nowhere even to the readers who are privy to every one of Wade's thought processes. Some might say far too many of his thought processes. He presents it in the same flippant tone as everything else in this book because he's too incompetent a writer to actually convey that Wade has hit rock bottom. No emotional beats are hit, the future narrator situation means it lacks resonance, and the threat of suicide is at a disconnect from what is textually just a few bad days. Wade tells us he's never been to the rooftop arboretum, but his apartment block has webcams set up, so not only does he know what it looks like, he's also seen three jumpers since he moved in. His plan is frank and realistic. My heartstrings have never been pulled by the idea of a dead Wade Watts, owing to small things like his behaviour and personality, but it's the presentation here that really stings. Many people with mental illness, myself included, have had times in our lives where we've had bullet-pointed lists and plans on how we'd approach the final end. This chapter hit me so much because of the sentence that follows it up. I was trying to decide what tune I should whistle as I plummeted to my death when my phone rang. What tune you should whistle? With one sentence, a teenager contemplating suicide is irresponsibly blown off as a tongue-in-cheek joke. A tragic topic reduced into a tasteless, tone-deaf, trivial gag that, like many digressions in this book, is completely throwaway. In summary, I'd like to preserve this line from my first cut of this episode. Thank you, and the stupid DeLorean mashup you rode in on. 
I think that says it all. Anyway, his phone rings. It's Shoto. Wei doesn't pick up, so it goes to message. Shoto tells him briefly that he needs to come to Parzival's stronghold to give him something. Something Daito had left to me in his will. Wade returns the call and you can tell that Shoto is a wreck. His quiet voice was filled with pain and the depth of his despair was apparent on the features of his avatar's face. He seemed utterly despondent, in worse shape than I was. So something's going on there. Wade's curious why there's even a will involved. Daito could have just given Shoto all his items and then set up a new avatar and received him back again. But Shoto told me that his brother would not be creating a new avatar. Not now or ever. When I asked why, he promised to explain when he saw me in person. End chapter 24. The last couple of chapters have been really short and it seems like the next couple of chapters are short as well. I never imagined that a chapter of this length could spring such a surprise on me like this episode did. Ordinarily when recording, I've read a few paragraphs ahead of what I'm commentating on so I can form a more intelligible opinion on what I'm reading. But the real unpleasantness of what I was reading wasn't hitting me until I was saying it aloud. I was taken surprised by how angry and upset I was getting, and, and I've got two recording sessions of this episode to prove it. Stories about depression can be told well, and only by people who have been there, but not with a hand as indelicate and disrespectful as this. And contextually, three paragraphs in a book dedicated to sucking off all the things you liked as a child is neither the time nor place. I ended my first reading this chapter well and truly fed up. If you want to watch me get fed up about more light-hearted things like toy robots or children's cartoons, you can follow me on Twitter at The Last Gherkin, or follow the show on Twitter at RPN underscore pod. Watch with subtitles on YouTube, The Last Gherkin, or get an MP3 download at thelastgherkin.podbean.com. Special thanks this episode go to my guest star gunters, Maya and Christy, who helped me find what I was trying to say. You can listen to their pop cultural exchange podcast, The Wreckers, at wreckersandrobots.podbean.com. That's R-E-C-C-E-R-S and robots.podbean.com. Special thanks as well to my compassionate, caring and wonderful boyfriend, without whom nothing is possible. If you've been affected by anything raised in this episode, I'll leave some resources down in the description below. Join us next time when presumably we find out that when Daito died in the game, he died in real life. I can't promise it'll be any more cheery than this episode. Feels weird to do the regular outro music after that. Let's do something different. <laughs>